Welcome to our third and last day of Kite 2021. It is a great pleasure for me to introduce our moderator, José Luis Roses, from Academia Nacional de Ingeniería, Argentina, who is going to present Technical Session 5, Education on Engineering. Hi, I am José Luis Roses, member of the Argentinian National Academy of Engineering. I am very proud to be the moderator of the fifth session, which is focused on education. During my 50 years as professor of engineering, a member of the staff of several universities, I understood that the main challenge on education is how to achieve balance in teaching basic concepts and updating knowledge. Today, this dilemma is quite important because we are living in a profound technological transformation, digital and energetic. Both topics will be dealt with in our panel. But let me put in context our next dialogue. Engineering is one of the key professions that shape our world. The innovation from engineering have created new ways of living and working, and they have shaped our societies becoming crucial to supporting and maintaining the development of our world. From the supply of essential services, such as power and water, the, bi the bioengineering hospitals, the products of engineering are threaded through people's lives, both individually and collectively. This means that engineers have a great responsibility, but also a great opportunity to ensure that they have a positive influence on society. Two trends on engineering education we consider in the design of this session. First, the need of a new generation with awareness and talent to improve innovation on emission reduction and climate change within the impact of the digital transformation. Second, to move towards a socially relevant and outward facing engineering curricula with uh, multidisciplinary learning and particular emphasis on student choice. With those ideas on mind, we are very satisfied that the three presentations of today are examples of how new disciplines such as system thinking, artificial intelligence, and dynamic modeling are forming a new generation of engineers prepared to face the complexity of today's work. After the presentation, we will have a period of question and answers. And I would like to encourage the audience to submit written questions to the panel through the Zoom chat during this meeting. And we will address them after the presentation. Finally, as has been tradition to the previous CAED symposium, there will be a space to know the opinion of the students. We have invited four students of different universities and orientation. They will answer two questions. Why do they choose to study engineering and what actions they propose to mitigate climate change? So we hope that it will be a profitable session for everybody. And now let me introduce our speakers. And I want to remember you that their CVs are available for on the CAETS 2021 website for consultation. The first in this panel will be Professor Naile Shah from the Imperial College of London. He will talk about how can engineers work with policy makers to achieve emissions reduction targets. He will describe an excellent system approach and a practical experience to net zero. In the second place, Dr. Nuria Oliver from the Royal Academy of Spain will present how artificial intelligence is changing both what we teach and how we teach it. She's an expert and her presentation will show us the immense potential of AI in the education and engineering, and especially to personalize the learning experience. 
Finally, our third speaker is Professor Eduardo Fracassi from the Institute of Technology of Buenos Aires, a private university, who will share with us the experience using the En-ROADS Climate Action Simulator. Eduardo has teached this simulator in more than 200 events with 5,000 participants in six countries of Latin America. So welcome everybody and thank you to be with us. Hello, my name is Nile Shah. I'm from Imperial College London and also representing the UK's Royal Academy of Engineering. And I'm going to talk to you about my opinion in terms of how engineers can work with policymakers to achieve emissions reduction targets. Thank you very much for inviting me to this event. So there are a number of challenges in engineers engaging with policymakers, and I want to give my personal opinion and also then use a specific example of a project that we've been involved in, which brings it to light. So first of all, I think it's very important when engaging with policymakers to have a clarity of vision and a roadmap and indeed a positive view of the future. I think engineers should be seen as people that bring solutions rather than people that bring problems. And that is really what policymakers are, are looking for. Second of all, I think it's, it's important to find the right balance between being reactive versus being proactive. So occasionally it's very important to be reactive. In other words, to be able to respond very quickly to a request, for example, you know, what are some of the engineering challenges to recover from COVID? But equally, there are times when we should anticipate problems and anticipate issues before policymakers have thought about them. And we set out our own agenda and develop some proactive projects so that we can actually bring some ready-made potential solutions to policymakers. What we do find though is that the engineering profession is very broad and it's not always homogeneous in terms of its views. So it's not the case that the engineering profession can just collectively agree something and bring it to policymakers. So within our profession, we need to make sure to engage with the different branches of engineering and work hard to reach some kind of consensus. Another important feature of engagement with policymakers is the importance of neutrality. So engineers should not be seen only to be pushing for a specific solution like, you know, nuclear power being the solution to everything or hydrogen being the solution to everything. It's important to always bring a, a balanced perspective. And there are, the way I want to cover these topics is by using a case study of, of a large project that I'm involved in called Systems Approach to Net Zero. So Systems Approach to Net Zero is a project which has been launched by something called the National Engineering Policy Centre of the United Kingdom. It comes under the umbrella of the Royal Academy of Engineering and it is a unified voice for, for 43 different engineering organisations, which are our main professional organisations in the UK, which represent around 450,000 professional engineers. The idea for the NEPC is to give policymakers a single route to advice from across the engineering profession and we inform and respond to policy issues. So we have this balance of proactive and reactive approaches. One of the main projects we're involved in is around net zero. So the United Kingdom a few years ago set a target of net zero GHG emissions by 2050. And what we're trying to do in a specific project called systems approach to net zero is to apply a multidisciplinary systems perspective to support climate change policy. The idea is to draw on expertise of a huge range of engineering disciplines and to combine this with some input from social science and system science. And what we're looking at is to add value to the many projects that are already going on in this area, particularly looking at transition to net zero future, covering systems issues like infrastructure, governance, skills, resilience, and focusing on some difficult topics for example, decarbonizing construction and decarbonizing aviation. So in this project, our focus is on the systems approach. Why are we following the systems approach? First of all, let me comment on what we mean by systems approach, because that is not always 
clear to everybody. So here, what we're trying to do is to integrate all the relevant factors and context in decision making so that we are really taking the best possible decisions by focusing on the challenges that are not single issue challenges, but systems challenges. It's often used in engineering for complex problems which have many elements in them. So the reason why net zero and climate mitigation needs a systems approach is that there are rapid and simultaneous transformations of many different subsystems. So there's the transport system, the energy system, the industrial system, the housing infrastructure, and so on. If we do not coordinate the changes in these systems, we will end up in a, first of all, non-cost efficient solution. Second of all, probably lock ourselves in to the wrong technology choices. So without a systems approach, we may find that the parts of the system do not connect effectively. And because the parts of the system do have strong interactions, so there are strong interactions between transport, housing, industry, energy, and so on, we really need to look at the system level as well as the subsystem. So here on, on, on the right hand side uh, of, of my slide here, you can see a number of the topics that need to be interconnected when we're looking at a systems approach. And we find this is a very good way for the engineering profession to engage with policymakers. Systems approach has some key elements. First of all, and central is to develop a shared understanding among stakeholders. So that involves the industrial stakeholders, policymakers, uh, engineering organizations, and so on. We need to have a shared understanding of what is the overall goal of such a project and what is the overall framework we may follow. We then need strong leadership and governance structures so that we can actually progress this project in an effective way. And then looking at some of the technical aspects of the problem, we need to look at these sectors and map the interdependencies and interactions. And later I'll be showing you an example of such a systems map for decarbonizing construction. With these projects, it's very important to try to identify some early outputs that can be shared amongst the community and with policymakers to demonstrate, first of all, how the approach works, and second of all, to demonstrate that the type of thinking does actually give successful outcomes. So one example of what we've been doing in this project is what we call quick identification of low regrets options. So these are some early opportunities for policymakers to make interventions in energy, industrial, transport and housing systems, which will be good opportunities to take us to emissions reduction, which are not then going to need rework in the future. So that's what we mean by low regret uh, interventions. And then most importantly, sometimes in the systems approach, we need a different way of understanding the problem. And that's where bringing together all the different branches of engineering can be extremely helpful, although sometimes also it takes a long time to understand each other's perspectives. So these are some themes of our systems approach to net zero project. The first theme is collecting together the stakeholders and building awareness of the value of a systems approach and the demand for engineering advice on net zero. So there we have engaged with a number of senior uh, politicians and civil servants to explain, first of all, what is the systems approach? And second of all, how it can support decision-making towards net zero, in particular from an engineering point of view. The second theme is what we call supporting the government in operationalizing systems approaches for net zero. So in this theme, our program is actually working with different government departments and hosting a range of workshops for senior civil servants to demonstrate how they can embed systems approaches and systems engineering thinking in their daily work. And this has been maybe the most successful theme so far because it has had a training and skills development impact and it will leave those government departments with some new ways of, of doing their work. And then the third theme is providing systems insights and other engineering based advice in relation to net zero. And so this is more towards the technical side, and therefore it's also giving support in terms of some practical advice in the key subsystems. 
We're also developing some specific topics which are related to the short-term priorities within the UK. First of all, the green recovery. So that is really how do we rebuild some of the economic uh, and other infrastructure after the COVID pandemic. Second of all, the UK is hosting the next UN Conference of the Parties in November, and we have a number of initiatives that we are working on related to systems for COP26. Uh, and the third is the UK government is publishing and producing a lot of plans, for example, recently a 10 point plan for climate mitigation. So those are some short term actions our, our project is also taking. So systems approaches to policy making, which is that first theme, what we have been doing with the senior civil servants is working with them to identify some of the key elements and pressures within their specific system, which are either providing opportunities or challenges and where interventions are going to make the most difference in bringing their system in line with a net zero economy. In this process, we can identify synergies and interdependencies between different decarbonisation strategies, different elements of the system and different policy priorities. And we can balance trade-offs, for example, cost versus emissions, and try to identify where there are co-benefits, such as health benefits due to reduced air pollution. In the systems approach, it's important not only to look at the technical aspects, but also the social, cultural and behavioural factors, because those can be opportunities and barriers. Importantly also is the so-called time pressures and sequencing. So working out when you are adapting a complex system, what is the right time phasing? What do you do first? What do you do second? What do you do third? This is often a kind of problem that is not well understood and it's very important to get it right. In any major transition of a system and net zero is of course a very major transition, there will be risks. So we need to identify what are the big risks and what are the mitigation strategies and are there going to be any unintended consequences and how can we deal with them? The future is always uncertain. So in the systems approach, we need to first of all identify what are the main sources of uncertainty and what impact they will have on our system and then to decide how we will build in adaptation possibilities as well. We also need to be honest with politicians and indeed the general public about the scale of the transition challenge. And we need to be able to explore and understand as we make interventions to quantify how effective they are and if necessary to allow ourselves to, to adapt and make changes. So we have some activities which are at the national scale and we have some activities which are at the regional scale. I'll talk to you about the national scale activities because those are most relevant for national engineering institutions like Royal Academy and the Argentinian Academy. So our first initiative is very much to support the institutions, governance frameworks and leadership structures across central government. And really what we're trying to do there is to provide opportunities for the government to engage with us to give analytical and technical advice on climate to help the government translate the net zero targets into all areas of policy and of course to reiterate the message that net zero requires stable leadership and long-term thinking. At the national scale we also need to develop analytical capability, information flow, reporting and other evidence that supports really do good quality decision making. So what we can help with as engineers is to ensure government bodies have access to the right data, have access to the right evidence, and that they are also using that in, in the best possible way. We can support them in quantifying and publishing carbon emission assessments for all public sector policies. So every time future projects or future investments are planned, we can help establish the emissions impacts of those. And of course, we can maximize the contribution of technology and support the mobilization of finance and inter international collaboration. So engineers can help underpin mission driven research, can provide technical advice to something like a national infrastructure investment bank, 
and of course to support international collaborations which I think for climate mitigation are going to be particularly important. So one case study of our work is decarbonizing construction. So construction is a, a large sector in most countries in the world and construction is very interesting because it also has a long-term impact in terms of the performance of the buildings in terms of energy efficiency and so on once the construction is complete. So we've identified four important areas for construction. First of all, product outcomes. How good is the quality of the building? Design and specification. How good is the thinking which goes into it? Construction and reuse. How is the construction process itself as sustainable as possible? And then finally, government procurement. Government actually procures a lot of construction in terms of refurbishment of new buildings, and they can drive a lot of innovation by specifying high specifications and large amount of renewable content. And we found in this project of decarbonizing construction, a lot of complexities, for example, the culture of the industry, the need for long-term certainty, the lack of education and skills, the variability in design standards and materials, some aspects of insurance regulation, and indeed, what is the outcome which is being valued? You know, how do you actually value a low carbon building? And so we have now put together a briefing document on how the government can achieve low carbon construction. And what we've been doing is taking a systems approach and being use, using that to address not only emissions, but also wider social, environmental and economic factors. And we have also used this briefing note to understand how we can also influence aspects such as finance and insurance. In doing this project, we developed a systems map, and this is just really not for you to read, but it's for you to understand the complexity of some of the challenges around the emissions reduction targets we've set in the UK and many other countries. So when we look at the actual elements and interactions required in the decarbonizing of construction, we see that it brings in many other subsectors and many other elements. And it just goes to highlight the importance of this systems approach to policy making in net zero. So as our project uh, develops, we've been thinking quite a bit about what does success look like. And I think every time as engineers, we engage with policy making, we should have in mind what is a successful outcome of such an engagement. And of course, for us, the highest level success outcome would be the UK meeting its 2050 emissions target in the optimal way. And to achieve that, the government would have a clear vision of the system which is required to meet net zero. And it has aligned all the stakeholders with this goal. The individual departments, which are covering different aspects of the system, like transport, industry, energy, and housing, are working together effectively with the shared goal and they understand the interactions between their different policies. The government can take quick and effective decisions in the face of uncertainty and can adapt as new information becomes available. And the government is clear about where decisions should be devolved, for example, to professional bodies or industry associations. And based on that are some capabilities that government should have based on engineering input so that it has analytical capability to do detailed systems analysis. It has governance mechanisms and systems capability to coordinate activities across departments. And it has access to the best engineering expertise to inform net zero policy making. So that is where the engineering community comes in. Uh, some more aspects of what success looks like. First of all, the system, which involves policy, regulation, education, industry, business models, and so on, is all tuned as a functioning machine to deliver the net zero goal, and of course, to look for co-benefits. There are ambitious and realistic interim targets because of course net zero is a 2050 target. We need interim targets, we need urgent action and stakeholders understand you know, what that urgent action is and what is their role in delivering. And they feel incentivized, so there's a strong business case and second of all, empowered to act and to start intervening. And you can see an example on the right hand side in the areas of change required from decarbonizing construction, which is we need improvements in designs and specification, 
in the process of construction in valuing the outcomes of the product that green buildings are actually valued and the whole business of construction is, is a changed business. So some conclusions. First of all, I think it's very important to take time to develop a consolidated view. So you can see that engineering, engaging with policy making is not something to rush. To develop a consolidated view does take time. It's difficult to get consensus. I can tell you that in our working group on this project, there have been a lot of discussions around, for example, how challenging should we set interim targets for decarbonizing construction? You know, how large will be the role of hydrogen in the future energy system? These are topics where, you know, there are no right or wrong answers and it's important to try to find a way to have a broadly harmonized view so that when the engineering profession speaks with policymakers, it's not giving 10 different perspectives, which just causes confusion. We need to focus as engineers on the challenges which add a lot of value to current policy. So there's no point just trying to do small incremental changes to current policy, but rather to think about some of the big important issues that we're facing. And that's why our focus has been on systems thinking rather than focusing on individual technology. So instead of focusing our policy advice or project advice on individual technologies, for example, you know, um, power generation, or heating systems, we've been focusing on integrated systems thinking. We do need to interact at key points, so we don't want to do a project where we set a, a target for the work, we go away for one year, and then we come back and engage with the policymakers. It's better to have interactions at key points so that we can adapt to feedback that we're receiving. And I think particularly important for the engineering profession is to be proactive and therefore to think ahead and think about the major policy challenges and not only to wait to receive questions from policymakers, but to, to think about what the major policy challenges are and to propose potential solutions before even being asked. So thank you for your attention and I'm really looking forward to seeing some of your questions. Hello, I am Nuria Oliver. I'm a permanent member of the Spanish Royal Academy of Engineering and co-founder and vice president of ELIS, the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems. Today, I'm going to share my views on the intersection between artificial intelligence and education. But before I enter into the subject matter, let's think a little bit about the context that we live in. We are immersed in what is called as a fourth industrial revolution, which is profoundly changing society as we know it in a similar way as former industrial revolutions. The fourth industrial revolution represents um, an intimate relationship unprecedented in our history between the biological, the digital, and the physical worlds. And it is enabled by key disciplines such as nanotechnology, biotechnology, genetic engineering, and of course, artificial intelligence. Artificial intelligence is actually ubiquitous in our daily interactions with most of the digital services that we use. AI algorithms are determining which friends we have, which updates we read from them, which news we read, which movies we watch, which um, books we buy, which music we listen to. Of course, we can talk to our phones and we can talk to our smart speakers and they understand us thanks to AI tools. Increasingly, mapping applications are also using AI algorithms to optimize the routes to take into account traffic, for example. For decades, um, stock market transactions are um, uh, determined by algorithms as well. And something similar has happened in the manufacturing processes where it, it is increasingly automated using robots enabled by AI. We wouldn't have autonomous vehicles without the help of AI. And science is really um, leveraging and being revolutionized by applying AI methods to large-scale non-structured data. But beyond all these elements, AI algorithms are starting to pervade consequential areas to human lives. For example, 
increasingly AI algorithms will support the clinical decision making and the diagnosis made by doctors or AI algorithms are already supporting judges in their, in, in their judicial sentences. And it is because of this ubiquity of AI methods that artificial intelligence has become a political issue, as this slide reflects, where it shows the number of times that the term AI and the term machine learning, which is the discipline within AI that is based on learning from data using statistics, has been mentioned in the UK Parliament and in the US Congress across time. And we can see that it's only uh, since 2016 that um, AI you know, has penetrated this political sphere. And therefore, it's no surprise that more than 50 countries in the world have developed their national AI strategies. Any AI strategy, from my perspective, should include five key dimensions. The technological dimension, the legal and regulatory dimension, the ethical dimension, the societal and education dimension, and the economy and labor dimension. I don't have time to talk about any of them today, except for the education di uh, dimension, which is the focus of this talk. AI is impacting education in two ways. First, in what we teach, because with the fourth industrial revolution, I believe that we should be teaching some new skills, but also in how we teach, because thanks to AI, we can actually change the way we teach. So let's look at, this, at each of these elements in more detail. In terms of what we teach, it is clear that the fourth industrial revolution is transforming the labor market. As it has happened in previous revolutions, there is going to be a displacement of a lot of jobs and, a set, and an automation of a lot of tasks within many professions in such a way that roughly a third of the new, of the new professions will, will be related to technology and the World Economic Forum, for example, predicts that there will be a net creation of millions of jobs, but these jobs will be very different from the jobs that will be displaced because of the artificial intelligence revolution. Only in Europe, it is estimated that there will be in the short term an availability of hundreds of thousands of new technology related jobs. So one of the key questions is, are we getting ready? Are we preparing the next generations for such a transformation of the labor market. From my perspective, we should be focusing on two key types of skills. First of all, I believe that we should introduce computational thinking as a core transversal subject since first grade in compulsory education. Computational thinking is a term that was coined by Professor Simon Popper from MIT in 1980. And the main idea is to teach students how to solve problems using technology. It entails developing five core competences, algorithmic thinking, programming, data, hardware, and networking. And I think every child and adolescent of the 21st century should be competent in computational thinking is the equivalent to knowing how to read and write in the 21st century. There are a few initiatives on teaching computational thinking, but many of them are private initiatives. And I think we should really think about and, 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 and try to make a profound transformation of the compulsory educational system for all children, not only for those that can benefit from these private initiatives. In addition to teaching computational thinking, I think we should also invest in developing creativity, critical thinking, and skills that are key to the existence of the homo sapiens and that have been key to our survival, such as our social and emotional intelligences. I, I provide an, um, uh, a discussion on such skills in a chapter called Digital Erudites in the book called Digital Natives Do Not Exist, or in Spanish, Nativos Digitales No Existen, where I uh, discuss some of the key elements or in emotional and social intelligence that I think we might not be um, nurturing enough and that I believe are absolutely fundamental for our survival as a species. In addition of what we teach, AI is really revolutionizing how we teach. And in this element, the, the key uh, aspect has been the tremendous progress that we have had in the AI field in the areas of pattern recognition, including 
natural language processing, speech recognition, speech synthesis, automatic translation, computer vision, so the analysis of videos and images, um, personalization, recommendations, and so forth. Let's, let's see some examples of how AI is um, contributing to improving learning. First of all, we have examples of improving early learning using software that helps children understand some basic concepts in their early years, both software, but also some robots, such as, for example, the robots that we see here on this slide, keep on from um, the computer scientist Brian Scasolati's team or TEGAS from the uh, MIT uh, Media Labs team. AI methods also allow us to adapt the learning to the different um, abilities and speeds of different children. We can also, of course, accelerate and improve the teaching of languages because thanks to AI methods today, we can recognize speech and we can also teach, you know, automatically translate and teach other languages. And these are a couple of commercial examples on how AI is helping uh, teach and learn foreign languages. AI algorithms are also behind software that teaches students how to write. But beyond teaching certain skills, I think one of the most important opportunities of AI methods is in supporting students that might have some learning difficulties or differences. For example, there are several, several um, software products uh, or projects that allow the detection of dyslexia and help students to learn how to read. There are also examples of using technology and power with AI to support students with emotional uh, learning difficulties, uh, for example, in the autism spectrum or with ADHD. And of course, thanks to the use of um, speech recognition systems, natural language processing systems, or computer vision systems, which are all areas within AI, we can uh, build assistive technology that can help the students that might have some physical impairment for their learning. AI will enable us to reach the vision of having one-to-one -one tutoring as opposed to one-to-many tutoring, being able to adapt the teaching to the needs of the student, both using software, like the examples that we see here, but also using robots, like the example here that supports students with their reading assignments. This is another example from Portugal from Professor Ana Paiva's team using an emotional robot that is teaching students how to play chess. And beyond improving learning, the other key area in education and AI is providing a better support to teachers and school administrators. For example, we can use AI methods to be able to do some individual student tracking and understand how well students are learning different concepts and with which speeds to diagnose potential learning difficulties. There are many chatbots today, of course, all of them empowered by AI that are providing support for administrative tasks and that also um, provide 24 seven customer service to the parents of the students or to the students themselves. AI tools can also be used to uh, perform intelligent scheduling of all the teachers or professors and the different subjects that are necessary in each school year. Some AI methods have been used to do automatic grading or to support teachers and professors in their grading so they can um, do it faster and more efficiently. And also there are some AI methods that I have been used and that I use to provide uh, career advice to students. So once they know the different um, um, interests of the students and their grades and uh, their characteristics, AI uh, models can recommend them certain careers that, that might be best suited to their profiles. And finally, there is a tremendous opportunity to be able to use AI to foster a safe environment for the students as this project, for example, illustrates. This is called the CRIT project and is to um, detect cyberbullying in schools. In sum, artificial intelligence is at the core of the fourth industrial revolution and is profoundly changing the world that we live in. I am convinced that we won't be able to tackle the pressing global challenges that we face without the help of AI. In this context, AI is also disrupting education in two ways. First, in what needs to be taught to the new generations so they can contribute to tomorrow's society. And second, 
in how we teach. Thanks to AI, we will be able to have a personalized universal education that is catered to the specific needs and strengths of each student. What more could we ask for? Thank you. Hi, this is a presentation for CAETS 2021 Argentina about the future of energy. I'm Eduardo Fracassi. I am the leader of ITBA's Climate Change Awareness Initiative. So ITBA is an engineering school in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And the degrees are about industrial engineering, chemical engineering, petroleum engineering, uh, mechanical engineering, and so on. Uh, and since the 90s, ITBA has followed the uh, MIT Management School uh, organization change um, tools and, and uh, leadership. And um, one of uh, these uh, initiatives is uh, the, the project that I am leading. We use the MIT uh, Management Sustainable Initiative tools like simulators and uh, and, and professors from MIT created Climate Interactive, which is an NGO that spreads this knowledge all through the world. And we are we are going to show you the results of these uh, events that we organized in Latin America, mostly in Argentina, but also in Brazil, Colombia, Costa Rica, Mexico, and Uruguay. Uh, we did this in uh, mostly in universities and secondary schools. The uh, universities that could be private or public. And you can see all the events that Climate Interactive has done worldwide. Uh, some of these events that you see here in Latin America were done by ITBA. And what are the results? Well, the first impact is that uh, since uh, 2018, all first year undergrad and students at ITBA use both uh, the M MIT C roads and N road simulators. This in in include the, the, the first available research published in peer reviewed journals. And we have, um, we did more than 214 events since. 2013 in nine years. 5,000 people participated in this, in this event from six different countries. So we started in 2013 to measure the effectiveness of the work, uh, the work climate events simulations that we were organization, organizing, uh, doing a longitudinal study with pre and post surveys. This, uh, uh, this research was very much interesting for the Climate Interactive and two people, Juliette Ronnie Barga from the University of Massachusetts and John Sterma from MIT, took this study and, uh, and published it in the journal PLOS ONE, as you see here. And uh, the, I will try to share the main result of this uh, research is that we find that uh, statistically significant gains in the three areas. Uh, first is uh, knowledge of uh, climate change causes and dynamics and impacts. Second place, uh, uh, affected uh, engagement, uh, including greater feelings of urgency and hope. You see urgency here, and you have, you have hope here. And these lead to more intent of action, climate action, and desire to learn more. And contrary to the information deficit model that's current today, uh, we find that uh, gains in urgency lead to more intent uh, to action and desire to learn. But on the contrary, knowledge, more knowledge does not lead to intent to action and desire to learn. So this is very important because we, we find that this learning model is superior. And then we did, uh, we participated in 2016 in the MIT Climate Callback Competition um, with a project that, that was created. A 19 year old bioengineering student 
proposing setting air conditioners a little higher at 25 degrees Celsius. After observing the uh, air conditioner used by their family, their father, her father's uh, used the, the air conditioner at 18 degrees, and she thought they are cold. They, they, they must use the extra blanket. So we, what about the using the air conditioner at uh, 22 degrees or, or more? And we did a study, we presented the proposal and we won in the industry category. But this was very important because uh, this saved about 14% of the energy uh, used for uh, uh, air conditioning. And the government um, must pay for a big part of this energy. So the president called us and implemented this proposal in, in uh, Argentina with a, a, a TV campaign, use your air conditioner at 24 degrees. Here we had the president of the ITBA uh, governance board, uh, our rector at the time. And these are the members of the uh, student uh, Kili team that helped uh, me uh, with this proposal and organizing these events in Latin America. And the, Latin, the networks that we helped us do these events are the System Dynamic Society, uh, the Latin American chapter, the Colombian System Dynamics Association, and the Brazilian System Dynamic chapter, and two lately, the Climate Reality Project, Mexico mostly. Now I'm going to show you one of these uh, simulators. This is the Enroad simulator. It has uh, here to the left, the global sources of primary energy, I will reset this and simulate. And this through the year to the um, 21st century, you see 2000, 2020, 40, 60, 2080. The energy produced from coal in brown, dark brown. In red, the energy produced by oil. In blue, the energy produced from uh, natural gas and in green, the energy produced from renewable sources and bioenergy in purple and in light blue uh, uh, nu nuclear. The energy production is measured in exajoules per year. This uh, graph at the right shows the temperature change along the 21st century. You see for 2020, we have a, a, a growth of uh, more, a little more than one degree comparing uh, with uh, temperatures uh, from the industrial re uh, revolution. So there is a temperature change of about 3.6 degrees. The Paris Agreement, the needs that, uh, that was signed in 2015 by more than 190 nations uh, state that the temperatures sh should be between these two lines uh, most uh, uh, the, um, tem the temperature um, should be a 1.5, that's the ideal temperature, uh, up to 2 degrees. You see that the basic uh, scenario is 3.6 degrees. So uh, we participants in the workshops uh, use these sliders about energy supply, uh, transportation, building and industry, or population and economic growth, uh, land and industry emissions from deforestation or other gases like methane and oxides of nitrogen, or carbon removal climate actions like planting trees or technological uh, removal of, um, um, of these gases. So, if, if I said uh, 50 percent uh, climate action, you can see that you will have in blue bioenergy, carbon capture and sequestration, uh, biochar here at top, and uh, forestation should be down in the lot, and direct air, air capture by machinery with the fans, big fans and chemical uh, products. Uh, 
it's a little in purple, this purple line and uh, mineralization that is transforming carbon dioxide into a mineral into stone. Um, it's another me method for removal uh, carbon dioxide from the air. Here, the simulator shows examples, the big measure, uh, key dynamics, potential for benefits of these measures, equity considerations, which are the slider settings and more information that can be used. For example, FA frequent questions and studies. So it's a very complete uh, instrument. When, when it comes to play with, uh, uh, with the participants, participants uh, mostly suggest um, fostering the renewals. And you see, uh, I will start again there. You have 3.6. Now I start, the, I, I use this um, renewables, 100% uh, um, a fostering 100% renewables, so the possibility. And you see the change from 3.6 to 3.4. If you see this globally, this really graphs, what we are doing is um, lowering the, the, the price of renewables. You see, they go down. But uh, if you have a great uh, quantity of uh, free energy, what we will get is uh, the, the demands, global demands of energy goes up. So that's not, that's a Jevons paradox. If you, you have cheap energy, people uh, will use more because it's cheap. So it's not much big, but, but it uh, shows that um, renewals uh, have a limited impact on uh, this uh, on the global mean temperature. Another proposed action by 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 uh, uh, people is uh, to keep to plant more trees, as China and India are doing. But you see that there is not also uh, there is, the impact is very low. The the greenhouse uh, net emissions um, per year go a little lower, but not much and temperature keeps at 3.4 degrees so what else can we do we can a new magic zero carbon technology like uh, uh, have the fusion of uh, of hydrogen and you see that it, it's in here in in uh, orange we can see the change but this competes the the, the we'll see the 12th graph. So energy demands is stable. And what, what happens is that uh, the orange line goes up here. We have more orange energy user, but the green one goes down. So there is a competition between renewables and a new technology. And the temperature drops only one tenth of a degree. So this is not a solution to climate change because it takes time to 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 get a new solution and market it and distribute it all over the world. Uh, another uh, thing is taxing the fossil industries. Uh, we will see that these two. What we get with this is, uh, well, temperature goes down, but we have not reached the Paris Agreement. We are very far away from two degrees. We are a little better, but that's not the solution. Because with three degrees, you have the certification of Central America and the certification of the North or South America. Well, uh, let's see what else what we do. One of the most important measures that you can take, and we show this in the in the in the exercises that mostly last two hours is carbon uh, pricing. That is setting a direct uh, tax on, uh, on fossil fuel consumption. And this has uh, several effects. Like for, for example, we repeat the climate action. You see the, 
the blue things moves, the slider, blue slider moves, and you see the changes. And this lowers energy demand. You see this graph changes. You have less energy demand with carbon pricing, that, and that reduces temperature. Uh, you have the, the prices of energy. You have a much lower price for renewables and fossil fuels like uh, coal get very more costly. Uh, and this is the blue line is uh, natural gas. But we are much uh, closer to the Paris Agreement, but we, we would need also energy efficiency in the transportation and the uh, in the uh, uh, buildings, like um, if you isolate uh, windows and walls, you use less uh, energy in winter for um, heating and less energy for uh, uh, air conditioning in summer. So this helps and uh, electrification also of transportation and uh, buildings also has uh, helps a little. Then uh, you could uh, try to keep your forests, and most importantly, is reducing methane emissions. And this now we are very very near the Paris Agreement, and using a little of technological rem removal, then we, we will be uh, inside the Paris Agreement. So these are the impacts and. This is the temperature change. Um, we, we have a successful climate change scenario. Well, let, let's get to some conclusions. First, there is no silver bullet. Um, what we have is a silver backshot. That is, we have to do several uh, climate actions at the same time to get to the Paris Agreement. Uh, and you see that we, it's possible to reach the, the Paris Agreement and to save uh, the climate, uh, to have our kids have the same climate that we're experiencing now. But the issue is that all nations should, must, and can uh, uh, work uh, together to reach this uh, Paris Agreement is the best that we can do for our children, uh, for the people that we love. Uh, we as people are emotional beings that think. That is why psychologists uh, tell us. So I ask you to connect this scenario that you can see it is possible. According to the best available science, it is possible to reach this uh, agreement. And it should be in our hearts, but because our hearts are the things that move us to success. Energy efficiency uh, is possible. Uh, it's something that we do, can do, and we do it in the Antarctica or in the Arctic. We can do it at home. Uh, keeping our forests and planting more trees are being done by India and China and the African countries are the south of the, the uh, Sahara Desert. Technological re removal of carbon dioxide is being explored. There are many pilot projects and we should get funding for them. Methane should be reduced. One of the cheapest things is to cap all uh, petroleum dr uh, drills in the Permian Basin because they are emitting methane and no, no one is profiting from that. Uh, uh, the same happens in, in China with the coal mines. We have pockets of methane. They should be sealed. Sealing these pockets of uh, methane is cheap and it can be done. And it has a great impact on climate methane. Um, uh, fostering renewables are, uh, are uh, growing so at a so fast speed that we have to reduce the baseline salario from four degrees to 3.6. And carbon price is good because it acts now. It has no delay. Government just state what the carbon price is. Argentina has a carbon price. So if Argentina can have 
<laughs> carbon price scheme uh, any country can um so it is possible it can be done but we need action now so i'm going to end this uh, presentation with a thank you that is thank you for attending this presentation you can reach me at this email fracassi at uh, itba.edu.ar and thank you so much it's a pleasure to be with you Hello. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations for everybody for your presentations. Really, it was very interesting. Let me remember you that we have uh, 50 minutes allowed to a discussion panel, and we received really several questions from the audience. So I prefer to make a very short answers to be possible to have to answer the more questions that we have now. Um, uh, as you know, I am an old gentleman, so I, I will be in with the lady. So, uh, Nuria, how do you are? Uh, I, I, I know that you are in... Hi, in, in, oh, it's a great place. Okay, so you are in a train. So, you are, you are using your iPhone, no? Could you hear me, Nuria? Okay, Nuria, do you hear me? Okay, well, we, we begin with Nile because I suppose that Nuria has... Hello, connection. can you hear me now? Okay, Nuria, the first question sorry, is for you. Sorry, I wanted to apologize. I, I had to take an emergency trip and I'm in the train and the connectivity is not great. So I'm sorry about that. Okay, well, the first question is for you, Nuria. Okay. Uh, which are your recommendations to transform the stock of teachers which are not prepared for the AI challenge? Yeah, so this is a very good question because the fundamental pillar in what I discussed in my presentation is actually investing in educating the teachers. So I think to be able to achieve um, the vision that I presented, uh, would require a very ambitious uh, plan in um, upskilling and reskilling um, the entire teacher workforce in the country to be able to be up to date to you know the fourth industrial revolution you know the 21st century and that is a pretty daunting task but I think it's a necessary task. We cannot forget that in most places in the world we still have a model of education from the second industrial revolution, but we are in the fourth industrial revolution. So I think educational reform is, um, is as necessary as it is urgent from my perspective. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nali, there is a, a question for you. Regarding the NPC project, um, looking the system thinking approach, how did you train different participants for applying this type of system approach? So what, what we did is we, we ran some workshops where we chose specific topics. For example, decarbonization of transport, road transport, decarbonization of aviation, and decarbonization of buildings. And with some expert facilitators, what we got people to think about is not the fine detail, but to understand how to draw systems maps which illustrate the key factors which are in play in each of these domains and to draw influence diagrams, not only within the system itself, but also the wider 
part of the energy system, like you know, electricity supply or fuel supply. So by engaging people in thinking about some simple tools like systems maps and influence diagrams, they started to understand how to get out from a very, very specific topic like, should I use a gas boiler or a hydrogen heat pump or a hydrogen boiler or electric heat pump into what are the wider systems issues for decarbonizing buildings? So we, we found focusing at the high level and thinking about the different systems elements and the interactions between them was a good set of tools to educate people and engage people in, in the area of systems thinking. Ah, we, we can't hear you, Jose. Jose, I think you're muted. Está muteado. Se tiene que desmutear. Excuse me. Well, the next question is for Eduardo. Eduardo, could you describe the student's reaction when you use the inroads model and the difference with the corporate officers? Well, uh, thank you, Jose Luis, for the, this question. Um, students were surprised by, by the urgency of the climate crisis. Sam spoke, uh, is this true? And then they asked uh, me, uh, I said, yes. I said, why haven't us uh, been told before of this crisis? <laughs> that was something that really touched my heart. <laughs> and uh, which is the difference with uh, the corporate officers? Is it the same or not? Well, uh, I was contacted by some uh, companies and they say, no, we don't want this model because it's not, that's <laughs> not what we want to tell our employees. Uh, but <laughs> that's right. And, and um, we presented this in the legislature on, on the Congress of the city of Brasilia and the, the deputies were very much interested and say, well, uh, recycling is part of what, of this model. And I said, well, that's uh, energy efficiency. So they were interested. So the very different reactions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Nuria, a question for you. You have mentioned the impact of AA in how we teach and you have given examples. The first question is, which one do you think is producing the most significant impact? Uh, probably assisted, assisted technologies to help students that have some kind of limitation. I think that's a huge, uh, not only an area of opportunity, but also a reality today. There is off the shelf software to assist the students who have some visual impairment or hearing impairment or even dyslexia or some other kind of learning impairment. So I think thanks to technology in most cases and powered by AI, we can actually um, enable any student to really realize their potential independently on whether they have any kind of, uh, you know, difficulty or limitation, physical or cognitive. So I think that's the biggest area of opportunity. Thank you. Nile from Yves Bamberger. Thanks for your great presentation. How many people we are, we are working on this project? How did you oh. convince? How did you convince the ministerial departments? So there's a there's a large number of of people working on this project because we need input from all the engineering disciplines. So we have a, a, a core working group and then a wider group of stakeholders. So in the core working group, there are about uh, 25 people, and we have about in the wider group about 50 stakeholders. The good thing in terms of persuading the government is the government's chief scientific advisor, although he's from a medical background, he's a great believer in systems thinking. So he has been um, discussing with each of the government departments the importance of employing systems thinking in the formulation of policy. And so by the time we proposed applying systems thinking to net zero, the groundwork had already been done and the, there was a lot of enthusiasm for the project. Okay, thank you. Eduardo, uh, around the inroads model, 
can you separate the impact generated by developed high income uh, and developing countries, low income, taking the classification of World Bank? For example, if there is an increase of three degrees according to the simulation, how much is produced by country groups? This separation could be essential to assign responsibility for policy making. Yeah, thank do you, think? you for the question. It's a very interesting question. Um, we do run the sea roads. It's another simulator that uh, mimics the negotiations that are being run in the COPS, the Conference of the Parties by the United Nations. And there you can see exactly what is the contamination produced by the, uh, developed countries, uh, developing countries A, that's BRICS, uh, Brazil, Russia, and so on. And then the developing countries C, A, B, which are the poorest countries of the world, including most of Latin America, Africa, and some countries from the from Asia. Okay. Nuria, could you share with us how far are the European educational systems on personalized education? Uh, well, I'm not an expert on the topic, but I think um, um, from a, from a non-technological perspective, I think most educational systems aim to provide some level of personalization or at least uh, be able to provide uh, or, at, or tend to the needs of, you know, every student independently of, you know, their learning speed or, or their learning abilities. Using technology, I think, um, is a different story. I think there are much uh, fewer examples of uh, personalizing the education uh, through the use of technology or uh, supported with the use of technology. I think in most cases is done in a more traditional, you know, classical way. However, I have to say too that the pandemic has really accelerated the digitization of most uh, schools and high schools in many, many countries in the world, including in Europe, uh, which might um, open the door to um, incorporating in a positive and uh, sort of like constructive way um, technology that could really enhance the educational system and, and really help the students. I have to say that most of the projects that I talked about are research projects and there is still a lack of longitudinal um, data to um, really determine the impact of uh, supporting the learning experience using technology. I am not uh, necessarily at all um, so like for using technology uh, at all costs and for everything, I think we have to be wise and we have to really understand the uh, positive aspects of using technology, but also the potential negative aspects. Learning is a very human and social experience and it really is accelerated by the emotional connection between the students and the teachers, being the adults teachers or being other students, we learn a lot from other people. And that's something that we have, uh, for example, missed uh, during the pandemic. So, so I think it's very important that we know the opportunities that technology and AI bring, but that we are also uh, not overly enthusiastic in saying, okay, now we're gonna eliminate all the physical contact and everyone is gonna be using technology because that most certainly wouldn't be positive for anyone. So I think we have to be um, a, you know, knowledgeable about the opportunities and, and use them. It makes sense, but I do think that there are many cases where it can really enhance and improve the learning experience. Thank you. Well, we are just very near the time allowed. So, uh, Nile, um your last question is, is the Royal Academy of Engineering an institutional advisor of the government or the parliament in the UK? If yes, how is the relation structure? That's a very good question. It's, it's, it's not an official advisor to the UK government or the parliament. It's, it's in many ways always on hand to provide advice and information. And it's been one of its ambitions to become more of a trusted advisor. So historically, it has always responded to requests for advice specifically about engineering 
related issues. But more recently, one of the ambitions of the National Engineering Policy Center is to be more proactive, to anticipate big engineering policy issues, to develop proposals and ideas, and then to present them to government departments and to ministers and to uh, members of parliament and so on. And so I think it will always be an independent body and it will always uh, you know, develop an evidence and science-based approach to policy challenges with an engineering flavor. But it, it, it will seek to become a very trusted source of advice and a trusted source of guidance. But it's not an official uh, part of government. It's, it is independent. Okay, thank you. Well, I, I need to close and I thank you for your presentation and participation. Really, I am convinced we talk several subjects which are included in the new agenda of engineering education. So thank you for all. And next yeah. we have, we have a, a panel, education with students, that perhaps another question that has been in, in you sent really you could understand which is the, the, the scope or the idea of the student have around our profession. Thank you Thank and you. we'll see you. Thank you. After listening three experience on engineering education, it's a time to know the student's opinion about our profession. For this purpose, we have invited four Argentinian students of selected faculties and different specializations. I have the pleasure to introduce you, Tatiana Antonovich for the Institute of Technology of Buenos Aires, Industrial Engineering, Julia Cantando from the La Plata National University, Electrical Engineering, Bautista Chiesa from the Buenos Aires University, Civil Engineering, and Lucio Moya Farina from the Technological National University System Engineering. They will uh, ask, uh, answer, excuse me, they will answer two questions. The first question that they want to propose them is, why do I study engineering? The first will be Tatiana. I chose to study industrial engineering to open my mind to new ways of thinking. I thought engineers were problem solvers, creatives, but also analysts. I was amazed by the idea of seeing the world with those eyes. University didn't disappoint me at all. I now realize the combination between creativity, intuition, analysis, and innovation. Specifically, industrial engineering's main purpose is to find better ways to do things, from designing alternatives to understanding the risks and possible outcomes. All these characteristics help us improve our surroundings. I wanted to leverage resources from education to be part of the new generation of leaders, and I thought of engineering as the best way to achieve my goal. So I, I'm Lucio. I'm sorry. Um... Like my my idea of studying engineers, I think is is by my by my childhood. I I love to build things with construction blocks when I was a child, and I also I I used to watch like the boxes. I didn't like to to, to read to the instructions and anything like that. So that's that's a concept that I, that I later I realized that was trying to reverse engineering. And as a child, so a little bit bigger, I was very lucky to have a computer early in my life. And I love to, to build things with that and, and like start programming little stuff. Uh, I remember my father bringing me like those big manuals and I say, and I, and I negating them. So I, because I like to, to understand things by building and by exploring the things. So when I was at high school, I already know that I was decided to, to study engineering. I didn't realize actually which one I was going to, to, to do. I was very attracted to electronics, mechanics, and also software engineering. So by the end of my, my 
high school, I, I ended up deciding to, to make software engineers because it was the thing that I had most at hand and what was more experienced by me, but all throughout my, my life. Hello, first of all, I'm very grateful to be able to participate. My name is Julia Cantando. I study electrical engineering at the National University of La Plata. Answering the question, I grew up in a home with an engineer father, so engineer was always a part of my life. Since I was a little kid, I always had a great concern about how things worked. This led me to pay more attention and dedication at school to subjects such as mathematics, physics, and chemistry. However, it wasn't until I knew how electrical energy was generated that I realized that I wanted to do that. In the first instance, nuclear energy was low at first sight. Later, I decided to study nuclear engineering, but engineer wasn't my only passion. A sport do as well. As a high-performance handball player, I had to balance my time and live in the capital city, and I couldn't move to Alcedo Institute. And I changed my focus to study electrical engineer. This decision went hand in hand with knowing the entire electrical world from generation, distribution, and facilities. I believe that study engineering allows me to contribute to community since it has a direct impact on its development. In engineering careers, the diversity of functions and the range of possibilities is very wide because it offers various files of actions and specializations. Finally, I'm very happy with the career I choose. An important point for me is that new thing constantly appears in this profession. As technology advances, electrical components and electro electronic devices are also constantly updated and changed. The electrical engineer will be able to accompany these advances and contribute with new ideas. An engineer is always in a continuous improvement process. So that's why I choose electrical engineer. Thank you. Uh, as most uh, engineering students do, I liked physics and math a lot during my high school years, but instead of becoming a physicist or a mathematician to study how things work, I, I realized that by studying engineering, I'd be able to create things to solve real life problems. And not only that, when it comes specifically to why I personally chose uh, civil engineering over the other careers, uh, it came down to a, a concept of immortality that I had uh, formed in my mind. and. What I mean uh, with this is that by building uh, things that won't only serve uh, a purpose to society, but will also outlast uh, my lifetime, keeping part of my work alive uh, way after my time here is done, gives the profession a sense of timelessness that no other career I know has in the same way. And after four years of studying, I realized that developing this uh, creative process will allow me to solve both uh, economic as, and social problems that surround society. Uh, so it won't necessarily come down to just building things that will outlive me, but to solve problems to help future generations. Well, thank you for your answers. Let me make you a second question. My second question is, what actions do you propose to mitigate climate change? I believe we give little attention to climate change. We are not thinking every day how we can turn our routine into a sustainable one, and neither are most of the industries. So I truly believe that awareness is the first step to fight it. Climate change is a well-known topic. We just need to make it our own. If we all show the importance of this matter, if we all start from ourselves, doing small but powerful actions, we can all send a message and for sure we'll be fighting against climate change. As a future industrial engineer, I aim to optimize industrial processes and use resources more efficiently. Going through and analyzing daily activities in organizations could help us save big amounts of energy. We can make big differences, not only on the environmental impact, but also on the organization times and costs. It's a win-win situation, right? 
I find in industrial engineers the nature of thinking outside the box, trying to find better solutions to current activities. Introducing sustainability is a restriction all projects should have, and we're responsible for it as we are for the success of the whole work. As technology evolves, our main concern should be to boost sustainable practices and understand how we can use it to improve processes and resources usage. During my leading experience as a student, I realized that the only way to achieve significant change is by working along with a team. Working at scale, mostly leveraging tech, allows exponential growth, and I believe that climate change requires immediate but steady actions. I think climate change is one of our biggest problems of humanity right now that we have to solve. Uh, science and engineer are, are very close disciplines and usually one feed from another and sometimes another that way happens. I think scientists have already made like a tremendous job studying, quantifying and informing about global warming. And now it's time for us the engineers to step up and do the next step. Uh, in the end, we are like natural problem solvers so that this is what we do. In particular, I'm as a software engineer, think that our shop impacts on all other engineers. We are like regular, we are like the glue that stands everything together. And so I think that we will have a lot to work to do in the years to come. Either be connecting systems, developing new technologies, or analyzing the data that, that other instruments are going to give us. We are going to have like plenty of work, like optimizing and doing better stuff to improve our energy consumption and a lot of other stuff that can improve the climate change. Answering the question from an electrical point of view, I believe that we live in an increasingly electro-dependent world with increased scarce resources. Society and engineers have the challenge of supplying this demand and doing it in a clean and efficient way. For this, it's necessary to take this issue with thought of integral sustainability. Think of solution in a multidisciplinary and long-term way to generate a real change in our customs. Engineering can help in the mitigation and adaptation processes in the face of climate change. Everything will depend on the training, education and interests of the people who apply their knowledge and skills within the various engineering specialties. I also believe engineering technologies, emerging technologies such as big data and artificial intelligence need to be given special attention, which are crucial to addressing the urgent challenges facing humanity. I think it's necessary to address rational disparities with inclusion, being a key point for sustainability. As future electrical engineer, I believe that access to energy is a right, which is why we face challenges in supply, transportation, and generation in precarious areas. Since, since engineering is the art of problem solving for real world issues, uh, understanding climate change as a man-made problem is the first step. Uh, then, if I use Argentina as an example, I think uh, countries in development are a constant example of not being able to focus on climate change because, justifiably, we have more imminent problems uh, like, high, high, like high levels of child poverty or inequality. Uh, but still, I think that since we study these long careers, hopefully to solve uh, future society's problems, we could incentivize uh, future engineering endeavors to promote sustainability. So even though solving socio socioeconomic problems is definitely a high priority for us, if we don't accomplish that in a way that reduces the impact on the, on the environment, uh, the purer communities are, uh, will probably suffer the consequences the most, uh, which means countries uh, in development that aren't able to think uh, long-term strategies will probably end up the worst. Uh, and well, this doesn't just apply to climate change, I think uh, I wish long-term strategy uh, became the new norm here uh, to solve problems uh, in Argentina. Well, thank you, Tatiana, thank you, Julia, Bautista, Lucio. It was very useful, your opinions, and it, for us, it's a, it's a great proud to hear you. And it's very interesting and very refreshment to know your ideas about a, a challenge 
of a subject so quite important like uh, climate change. Thank you, and it was very useful, your opinion.